How's it going guys? And welcome to another episode of Secret of Silent Success. Today we have the one and only Latara Edman. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. So let's jump right into it, right? So you graduated from A and M mm -hmm. and you had a degree in broadcast journalism. What was your initial plans in school and, and, and getting out of school? Well, initially I was going to uh, I wanted to work at um, an ad agency or I wanted to be a news anchor. Okay. Okay. And so <laughs> when I graduated um, from college, uh, prior to graduation, actually, I interned at a, a television station and realized that being an anchor wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, then I went and uh, interviewed at the Richards Group, which is actually in downtown um, Dallas, but they weren't hiring until like the spring. And I graduated in December of 2000. Mm -hmm. So I um, ended up working for a small newspaper in Cleburne, Texas, which is like 67 South in gotcha. Dallas, yep, so yep, yep. very small newspaper, but the publisher came to one of our journalism classes, made an impression, and so I decided to go that track. Gotcha, gotcha. Interesting. Uh, I actually, when I first got into media, I wanted to be a news anchor. Really? Yep, and then I wanted to be a sports commentator, and then I took a couple classes so on camera <laughs> stuff, and I was like, you know, behind the camera seems to work a lot better Exactly. Right, even though now we're both in front of the camera. Right. So look how it came full circle. So you end up uh, working for the Dallas Morning News for a time. How was it being uh, an African-American woman in corporate America? What was your experiences like? Well, um, starting with the newspapers, the smaller newspapers, I was actually on uh, track to be a publisher, believe it or not. Wow. And um, started off as a marketing uh, manager, worked my way up to an advertising director, and then I uh, started working at the Dallas Morning News as an account executive. I mean, it was a positive experience for me. I enjoyed working in the newspaper industry. Um, mm -hmm. I learned a lot about media. I learned a lot about what is comprised of putting together a publication. A lot of times people think when you're working at a newspaper that it's just about the editorial side. Everybody sure. assumed that you're a reporter, but there's a business component to it, you know, mm -hmm. the advertising, graphic design. So I learned a lot about the business, and it was, um, it was a lot of exposure. I learned a lot, learned a whole lot working there. So. Got you. You named several positions through your time uh, at the smaller newspaper, working your way to the Dallas Morning News. What was it like to climb that ladder? What were some of your strategies? How did you do it? How long did it take? What was some of that process of climbing that ladder? Well, in the smaller newspapers, um, we were a part of an organization called the Newspapers Association of America, and they actually had a track for African Americans um, who were um, – in a position to either become an advertising director or um, be on track to be a publisher. And they would pay for us for ha to have fellowships to be able to go to different conferences so we could learn more about the industry. Again, I was just put in a position um, to be around people who mentored me um, and were promoting me to, or investing in me rather, to um, to be the best I could be in that particular industry. But as I started to get those higher roles and, and getting into management, if anybody's ever been into management, it's a lot of work. It and is. I was very young. I was like 23, 24 maybe, and I had like a staff of like 15 people. Wow. And so I was just like, I don't know if this is really <laughs> what I want to do, if I want this much responsibility at such a young age. So, But overall, the experience was great. I had a lot of people pouring into me. Um, again, a lot of fellowships that I qualified for, and they paid for. Um, classes and things of like that, things of that nature. So it was, it was great. I mean, I enjoyed it. Gotcha, I gotcha. Time. Going a little bit off the show notes here, but you said something interesting. You talked about having that much responsibility as a 23, 24 year old. Yes. <laughs> a lot of young people shy away from that. I believe that you were given those responsibilities because you show you were competent enough right. to do them, <laughs> right? So what what is your thought process? Because like I said, a lot of people will shy away from that responsibility. Right. And at 23, 24, you you took it and, and, and ran with it. Well, because at, at that age, um, I was promoted amongst my peers. And being new into corporate America, also in a new industry, um, you know, newspaper industry, you know, the demographic is typically older. The audience is older. A lot of people have been in those positions for a very long time. And, you know, you had other uh, managers in, in the departments that I was working at, at that were like, oh, she's young. She yeah. doesn't know. The editor had been there 20 years. You know, here <laughs> I come, 24, 24 years old, all excited, you know, have all these bright ideas. And they're like, slow your roll, mm -hmm. you know. And then being a promoted amongst your peers was a very uh, challenging thing for me because one day we're best friends and we're all going out to eat lunch to get together. And then the very next day I'm your boss and I'm having to tell you what to do. And so um, didn't get any training on that. I mean, they did. I did get a mentor and she tried to guide me through it. But the everyday trying to manage your friends it was tough. I mean, and I, immaturity wise, I just 
I wasn't mature yet. I hadn't had enough work experience to know really how to manage that. Gotcha, gotcha. So a little bit of a two-part question. Uh, how did you go into your own to learn how to manage that? And then how have you used some of those skills that you learned in management in corporate America to help grow and sustain your business today? Whew. Well, um, the fellowships helped. I was assigned a mentor. It was a female publisher. Um, I want to say she was in Philadelphia. I can't remember exactly. But having her as a coach was extremely helpful. Um, and then um, transitioning from the newspaper industry into having my own business. I mean, it, everything from customer service to, um, you know, when you're a business owner, you're an entrepreneur, you wear several different hats. There's yep. days when I'm the janitor, I'm the receptionist, you know, I'm a hairstylist, I'm a manager. And so being in corporate America and having those different jobs prepared me for running my own business because I seen the backside of all of it, human resources, everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I have to step into those roles for myself here so um again learning how to answer the phone and greet people to uh balancing a budget yeah. you know and knowing what a profit and loss report is i mean i had to deal with those things in corporate america and it rolled over into what i'm doing today gotcha gotcha so tell me a little bit about the uh relationship that you had with a salon business manager that kind of got you back into the styling in in, in, in hair industry what as, the, as I uh, worked at the Dallas Morning News, I was an account executive, and my job was to help small businesses to grow. And I um, developed a, a relationship, rather, with a uh, salon manager at a salon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, was trying to get her to advertise in the newspaper <laughs> and um, was just very intrigued with the setup of their salon, and it just piqued my interest okay. again. Always enjoyed doing hair. Um, just never thought that it would be something that I can make into a lucrative career mm -hmm. until I started talking with her mm -hmm. and I started realizing, wow, this is something I could, I could do for a living. And at that time the internet was taking off. Um, the newspaper industry was, was having a shift sure. where not as many people were reading the paper. Everything, everybody was going towards online. Mm -hmm. I survived a couple of layoffs and then the light bulb just went off. You know what? I teach people every day how to grow their business. Why not go to cosmetology school, get my license, and apply that skill set to running my own business. Sure, sure. So let's go back a little bit. Um, talk about where your love for hair and cosmetology came from. And then you said some interesting there. You were like, I don't think it was something I can make money with. Right. You know, even <laughs> for me, it's like, can you really make money doing videos? Right. Or can you really make money doing hair? Or can you really make money playing video games? Right. Right. There's a lot of creative, non traditional avenues in society tells you you really can't make money in that. Exactly. So I want to hear where did that ideology come from that, hey, I couldn't make money in this. How did it change? And just where did your love for cosmetology come from in general? Well, I mean, as a little girl, I wanted to go to the salon. And I would see my mom go. She didn't go often, but she would go every once in a while. And I, quite frankly, got tired of sitting in the kitchen, having her press my hair with a press and comb and burn me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I want to go to that the salon. Comb. Right, that hot comb. <laughs> and she was like, you know what? I can't afford to take you to the salon. She gave me some hair magazines and was like, why don't you try it yourself? And I was like, okay. So I started going through the hair magazines and literally started emulating what I saw in the magazines and became pretty good at it. And before you know it, you know, she was like, well, do your sister's hair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, do my hair. And then, then I'm doing everybody in high school. Everybody's coming to my house to get their hair done. Sure. Um, but with that being said, I didn't have any examples in the community of anybody that I felt like was really they were successful at being a hairstylist. It was treated more like a hobby, okay. um, more like a side hustle. It was something that you just kind of did. You know, no, I didn't really know anybody that took it seriously. And in our household, we were taught from a very young age, you're going to college. So it was just, again, it was a side hustle. Even when I was in school, mm -hmm. you know, I did hair on the side, you know, just to have money. And so it wasn't until I met that salon manager uh, that I realized, you know, this, if you do this right, if you treat this like a business, it could be lucrative. Yeah. You can make a living doing it. I was going to say, so what did that salon business manager say, or was there an epiphany, aha moment that you saw it could be more than just a side hustle? Was it, what is it that that salon manager said to you? Well, what she told me was to do my research. And so at the Dallas Morning News, we had access to resources um, called AdMall, which basically gives you industry information. Mm -hmm. And so even though I was pitching her, trying to get her to advertise with us, it did compel me to go back and do some research on the beauty industry. And that's when I found out it was a billion-dollar industry. Yep. <laughs> and so I asked her, I said, you know, well, traditionally in the, in the black culture, I haven't seen many examples of salons that are run like this, the way you have this set up. You have a salon manager. You have a business manager. I just haven't seen it. And she told me something that has stuck with me 
to this day, and that was probably like 2004, 2005, um, that unfortunately black salons are typically eight to 10 years behind um, what industry trends are in the beauty industry. And that it was due to a lack of business acumen and education. And so that was an aha moment for me because it's a billion dollar industry and we weren't really truly getting our piece of the pie. And I was like, okay, so there are people out here um, who are like me, who fit my demographic, who want to come to a salon like this, where are they? And she gave me a list because she knew who her competitors were. She knew where all the high-end black salons were and challenged me to go out and research them and find them, and that's exactly what I did. I went out and found them, and I interviewed them and just kind of got a feel for, um, you know, why they were in the location they were in, how were they attracting their customers. I just started asking all these questions and um, just realized that, It just wasn't a lot of them out there or they weren't really having they didn't really have a marketing plan in place to um, especially with the change and the shift in the with the online booming. They didn't know they were totally uh, relying on business cards and people, you know, word of mouth. mouth. Mm -hmm. That was it. And Mm -hmm. word of mouth was evolving. Word of mouth was becoming Google and all of those things. And they just weren't prepared for it. So because I had that unique position of working at a, a newspaper where I had uh, access to marketing and advertising information, I was like, well, I'm just going to take advantage of this and, and use it for myself. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, it sounds like quite a bit of work went into this. So you're, you're still working at the Dallas Morning News full time. <laughs> you're talking about uh, meeting with this salon business manager, going out there interviewing other salons, doing research. And this is at the at the cups of Google. So it wasn't as easy as picking out your phone right. and typing in salon average. You had right. to go and dig for it. Right? right, exactly. So from an intangible standpoint, where did that drive come from? Was it just you were inquisitive about it? Did you really feel like, hey, this is my passion and my actual true purpose? What was in your mindset to make you do all of the work when you didn't know what was on the end of the tunnel? The fa- Well, the fact that I found out it was a billion-dollar industry. Okay. <laughs> hey, 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 money talks, money talks. <laughs> right. <laughs> money I was talks. like, well, okay, I want to get a piece of this pie. <laughs> so I was excited about that. And then I really genuinely enjoyed doing hair, you know, and I thought, man, to be able to marry making money with something that you truly enjoy doing every single day, enjoy making people feel good about themselves, um, and having a talent that, you know, you're just blessed with and, and you can make money off of it. Um, couple that with having a background in marketing advertising and so just knowing from working with customers um that you know most of us are very good at our craft if you're a plumber you're probably one of the best you know if you're a makeup artist you're the best at that if you're a hairstylist you're the best at that but the business side is usually what's lacking and i knew that i had a unique position um to couple my craft with my background my my advertising and marketing experience um with my passion I was like, I'm just going to do it. On top of the fact that, you know, newspaper was changing and I survived a couple of layoffs. It's like I didn't really have anything to lose. You know, why not? Because yeah. at, at that time, we were going through layoffs. You would come, it was nothing for you to come to your desk and they would have packed your stuff up, boxed it, and was escorting you out the door. Yep. So it was like, okay, I can stay here and get laid off or I can jump out here and try something completely new. Um, and so I, I made the shift from working part-time. You know, I was doing hair in the evening and... Um, working at the Dallas Morning News in the day and I was like it's just time to make a move by that time I had two kids I was I was overworked and I was tired <laughs> and something had to give and so it was the Dallas Morning News that I had to give up <laughs> got you, got you. so I actually got two two kind of ideas to go with that that last comment the first is you talked about you know if you're a plumber you're the best at it if you're a hairdresser you're the best at it and it's these niche roles okay and businesses sometimes struggle with solo entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs because they lack the business acumen. Right. Right. What is some advice that you can give to some entrepreneurs who are, you know, I'm really good at IT and coding. I don't know anything about marketing, advertising. Right. And for me, I, I truly believe that it's the soft skills right. that make your business successful. It's, I believe I'm great at what I'm doing. I'm sure you believe you're great at what you do. But there's a lot of people that can do what we do. Right. Right. Exactly. The, the, the challenge comes is when you have to couple that with the soft skills, right. with the marketing, with the emailing, with the branding, with the advertising. So what advice do you give to people who may be super niche, who want to do a business, but may struggle with those ancillary skills? 
I would say uh, get a team. And unfortunately, when you're first starting out, you may not be able to afford a team. Okay, right? <laughs> well, That's hard. Egg, yeah, right? you, you literally have, you know, multiple hats that you're wearing. But either network with people um, who can give you advice in those areas. Like, you need an accountant. Yep. You need a lawyer. You need a marketing representative. Um, you need people in those areas that where you're weak that can help you to come together. I mean, you have available resources at the SBA, mm -hmm. um, Small Business Association office, where you can go and they will team um, team you up with people um, that can help you with those things. But you have to start off with a plan, uh, a business plan first, um, to get your vision in place, your goals and your action steps, and then surround yourself again with a team of people who can help you to make that idea come to fruition. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't have some of those key principles in place, you may start off with your vision coming together and it'll quickly fail. It'll quickly come to a demise because you don't have all the other core principles. You don't have a strong foundation to keep it going. And I think that's why most entrepreneurs within two years, their businesses can close because they are really good at that one thing that they're doing, but maybe they don't have the financial part together or they don't have the capital or they didn't, you know, they don't know how to budget or whatever the case may be. So I think surrounding yourself with a team of people who are experts in the areas where you know, you're not the strongest um, to kind of help you build, even if it's just them giving you advice and some, some tips. So you talked about doing the Dallas morning news. You were also doing hair on the side and had two kids yes. and one had to give, right? <laughs> Uh, I know you mentioned that it was a transition in the newspaper industry, so you know people getting laid off every day. So you were like, "Hey, you know, why not?" But for uh, many of us, we have that steady income coming in at yeah. that nine to five. <laughs> Even if you love this, you see a little bit of ROI on it. It's really hard to leave that nine to five, especially when you got two kids in yes. the house, right? <laughs> what was what was your thought process? How did you build the, the courage to leave that nine to five and go full into the entrepreneurship? Well, I was terrified. Um, because I think there's always a little bit of fear when you're jumping from one, um, one to the other, especially when you have, you know, people depending on you and you have a family, um, to support. But again, it went back to coming up with a, a plan. I'm a numbers person because my background is in advertising. So I literally sat down and said, okay, if this is the amount of money that I'm making at this job full time, how many clients do I need to create? And how often, how many times a day, you know, and what would my average ticket be so that I can recoup what I'm making at the Dallas Morning News and literally had to come up with a strategy. OK, now, you know that number. Now, how are you going to get to it? Are you going to promote through a website? And like you said, the search engines and all that hadn't Google had wasn't even in existence yet. Or if it was, it was just taken off, so it wasn't as popular. But I had to really think about how am I going to get these people to find me? You know, how are they going to locate me so that I can get to this number so that I can be able to afford and take care of, of my family. So I think being diligent and coming up with a plan yep, yep. and then working the plan um, and being consistent um, was very key uh, for me. But it was scary. I mean, because you don't know. You, you It's a faith walk. You jump out there and you hope it and pray that you're going to get the customers. i never forget one of the things I was really afraid about um, because I was working in the evening. I was like, well, people are going to go during the day to get their hair done. I was scared. I was like, I'm so used to people coming in the evening and I'm, I couldn't fathom. I'm like, well, what are they doing? You know, if they're supposed to be at work, needless to say, women come during the day to get their hair done. <laughs> and so, um, it just it evolved. You know, I, I, I resigned from the Dallas morning news. I started, I opened my schedule up and it just started to fill up even mm -hmm. during the day. People weren't coming during the day because I wasn't available there you go. during the day. You know, and, it, and it's like once that I woke up to that, I'm like, but there are people who have flex schedules or they have jobs where maybe they work in the evenings so they could come during the day. And then once they started finding me online, I grew significantly because of my website. So um, it just ended up it just ended up being a blessing and working out. But I think it's because I had a plan. Yeah, I had a plan. it sounds a lot like my favorite term is reverse engineering. Yes. Right. You knew I need to make this dollar right. amount every month <laughs> to be able to support myself and right. family. I know I charge this amount per head. Right. That amount divided by that amount is, is what? what I need. <laughs> and how do I get there? <laughs> how do I get there? Right. So <laughs> it, it, it sounds super complicated, but it, it's simple math. Right. I know I got to do a, a hundred heads this month to be able to make what I was making at the exactly. Dallas Morning News. And if I can get that, then I can be able to sustain my, my, my current lifestyle. Exactly. That's gotcha, exactly gotcha. what it was. So how 
just like many industries, I know uh, cosmetology and hair, it's a very competitive industry. Yes. So how do you stay relevant? How do you stay current? How do you stay competitive in the industry? And how do you get clients? I know as a business uh, owner myself, that that's the number one name of the game. How do you get right. customers? How do you get clients? And it's a ever-evolving door. So in your industry, in your service, how do you get clients and keep clients? Look, in Duncanville alone, which is where my salon is located, it's over 100 salons just in the little old Duncanville. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can imagine how many um, hairstylists, um, cosmetologists there are in, in the Metroplex alone. And so it's about being relevant. You know, uh, top of mind awareness, being everywhere at all times, whether that's having a website, uh, being on Google search engines, having a social media presence, partnering with the community mm -hmm. to do um, events. I pretty much do it all. I try to have my name somewhere at all times, um, whether it's, you know, face to face you know, marketing with clients or internal marketing with clients here, like I said, in the community or e even if it's on social media, we get a lot of our clients off of Google. Okay. Um, so many people do search engines. You know, I I'm learned at the Dallas Morning News about search engine <laughs> optimization and behavioral targeting and knowing that when people need something and they're actively looking for a business or actively looking for a product or a good, nine times out of ten they go to Google. Yep. You know, and they type in the keyword. I've done research on the keywords. You know, what keywords are you looking for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when you're looking for a salon in particular. And so making sure those words are factored into my website or even mm -hmm. I'm using the hashtag. So when they pull those things up, they're more than likely to pull my business up. But I think it's just being creative and thinking outside of the box and trying to figure out ways to, to make your business relevant at all times. Yep. And that's a full-time job because, you know, <laughs> you, you have to come to work and do the job and then... When you leave here, I'm at home thinking about, okay, now I have to post something, you know, or mm -hmm. now I have to share something just, or I got to see it, send out an email blast or a text blast so that people are constantly thinking about me. Even if they're not coming to me today, maybe next week when they feel like they need a hairstyle, they'll be like, oh, I remember I saw that good hair day. Yep, and yep. then they'll call me. So you just have to be creative. Gosh, and that's what I was going to ask next um, for someone who has an established business are you still doing a lot of the hands-on Google ads and posting and media blast? Or is that something that you're outsourcing? What's your current uh, work as at the moment? I, I actually do a lot of it myself. Okay. Um, I have hired a publicist, so she's helping me with um, getting my name out there, um, getting in front of the camera, doing things like this, which helps a lot because I don't have the time or maybe not even the resources and the connections to, to reach out to people like that. Sure. But posting on Facebook and, you know, social media and stuff like that, that is, that could be a nine to five that job. That is a job with them. <laughs> it really <Amen>. is. <laughs> so, you know, you have to use, you know, programs like Hootsuite and, you know, I have to literally be diligent about on the weekends planning out what my marketing strategy is, what I want to promote, and using Hootsuite or something like that to where when I post on one, it blasts it to, to all of them. Yeah. So maybe I'm not spending so much time. But, yeah, for the most part, I pretty much I pretty much do it all. Got you. And in terms of, of time, I'm going completely off the show notes now. I'm just, as a business <laughs> brand, my, 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 my wheels are turning. Uh, in terms of time, you know, how, how do you allocate time? Is it, you know, 50% of the time when I, for my business time, fifty percent, okay. I'm working on I'm working on doing hairstyles. Twenty five percent, I'm sitting down on a Sunday for two hours, you know, setting up the marketing plan for Ooh. the week. Uh, Twenty five percent, I'm doing administrative duties. Like, how do you delegate your time to yourself, and how do you know what to delegate to others? Well, easy to delegate to others when it's something that I know. I'm either not very knowledgeable on and okay. it's not my area of expertise, like accounting. I have an accountant, okay. you know, I have an attorney, things of that nature. Um, the marketing and advertising, I guess because that's my background, it's not so hard. It's just more that it's time consuming. Yep. I can honestly say there are times when I'm up at three or four o'clock in the morning doing stuff. Um, I usually try to allocate a day out of the week. Like okay. usually like a Sunday or a Monday where I focus on gathering all my data together. You know, this is what I'm going to promote. You know, I'm going to schedule these ads and then I roll with it. Um, dang, if I could put it in percentages, it's definitely not fit. Probably 25% of my time is spent uh, focusing on marketing and advertising. The rest of the week I'm in here working. Yep. And so, um, but again, I can't tell you a time frame. I mean, it might be, I found that it's best to post like five, six o'clock in the morning before I start my day. 
or to schedule them, you know, so that they, they roll out at the beginning of the day. Cause like most people, when they wake up, they get up on their phones. The yep. first thing they do is look at that phone. Mm-hmm. So I schedule my posts to go like around seven o'clock. Cause I know when they wake up, I'm going to be the first thing that they see <laughs> in the morning. But, um, I mean, it's just, you have to work on the business, you know, and most of us are, are so um, programmed to work in the business the whole time that we forget about working on the business. And then it, it, it slacks. And you have to set aside a day or two to, to, to focus on paying the bills, um, you know, uh, doing things like this and getting your name out there, marketing, doing community service, whatever you can besides actually being in the business. Because when you get in the business and you're here and, that, and it's nine to five, that's it. You know, you're consumed with what you're doing when you're there. And so it's really, really hard. Because, you know, you want to go home, you're tired. You want to take a nap. You know, <laughs> or you got to spend time with your family or right, whatever. Right, so right. you have to set aside a day um, and dedicate that to working on the business. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that's great. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm soaking it all in because I know even for us, we struggle. Like, you do, you get so much client work. Right? Yes. And we, we are a media company. Right. right. And we fail to produce media for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, so well, that, that 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 I'm just listening. I wouldn't even pay attention to the notes. It, that whole thing you can't just work in the business. You gotta work. You gotta work on, on it, business. Michael. Yeah. Because I mean, that's just people like, oh well, who does your hair? And I'm like, uh, I don't have time to do. We barely have time to schedule appointments with each other. Ver- rarely do I hear. And you're like, but you're a hairstylist. I have to look a certain way. I have to because I'm representing what I do. Yep. But to actually carve out the time is usually at home. I'm like, it, it, like I said, five o'clock in the morning, I just have to jump in the shower, wash it, blow dry. I literally was curling my hair before, right before you came, <laughs> you know, because Crystal was like, are you going to look like that? I was like, no, I'm going to get it together. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get it together before he comes. But gotcha. I mean, it's, it's hard because this is what you do every day. Yep. You're yep. to get putting this package together. When are you going to have time to put yours together yeah, for yeah. yourself? Yeah, it's just absolutely. hard. Yeah. I mean, so it's absolutely. a balancing act. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of duplicating yourself, mm. I found that to be one of the hardest things for a business owner from a services standpoint to That's find true. others that can do what you do and do it well. Mm. And then from the standpoint of running the business. So how did you scale your business? Because I, I would assume you probably started off solopreneur. You're talking about working at the Dallas Morning yeah. News and then doing it on the side. How did you scale it to be a, a full salon with multiple people doing heads? Wow. That's a, okay. Good question. So when I first started out, I was working inside of a suite okay. solo. Um, and then I, because of my website was getting an influx of customers and I was growing rapidly and my accountant is the one that called me and was like, Hey, you might need to think about opening up a storefront and expanding your business. And that was always the goal. Mm-hmm. I just didn't expect it to happen as rapidly um, as it did. But when I finally opened up this location, I'll be here in 10 years in June. Congrats, so I'm, I'm so excited about yeah. that. But um, networking with um, some of my past um, associates who were cosmetology instructors and, and getting networking with them about getting students in who were just coming out of school and even because I transitioned into this career later in life right so I had another career I transitioned into this so I had a, I still had a lot to learn about the industry specifically but then how do I get other people to come in and join me and it was it was about networking with other um, instructors who were uh, teaching other students who were breaking into the industry as well and then wanting to teach them a particular way of how I wanted my business to be ran. I wanted to reframe how the black salon was looked upon in the community. I don't want us to be treated like we're a hobby. I wanted us to be taken seriously, and I wanted to break a lot of those stereotypes that I even personally had about uh, the experience at the black salon. And so when you get students who come in from out of cosmetology school who have not been exposed to anything else, then you get the opportunity to kind of mold and create the the kind of uh, stylist that you want to be in your business and you can shape how they think and how they perform which then shapes the experience that your customers have and so I think if you have that I mean you really can't go wrong and most of the time they're going to do things exactly how you taught them and if you're teaching them good practices (laughs) you you know or or if you teach them bad bad practices practices. that's true hopefully you're treating them good right hopefully you're treating them good practices and then you'll be able to keep them um, around for a while and it, it does help to um 
cultivate the culture and the environment of your of your business. So that worked pretty well for me. Most of the stylists that have come here, they their tenure is, you know, five, six years. They come yeah. and they stay and then if they evolve and, you know, want to expand and open their own salons, sure. they leave and I know, hey, I had something to do with that. And I feel pretty good <laughs> about, you know, their growth and, you know, what they're moving on to. Um, but scaling is tough, you know, um, especially within the salon industry. We usually have to create a product line or something that's mm -hmm. going to generate like passive income. Yep. Because w working behind the chair gets taxing on your body. It, mm -hmm. This is a very labor intensive job. Yep. You can I'm, only do yeah. so many days. Yeah, <laughs> you can only end so, so many hours. Yep. Like you literally yep. have eight to twelve. I remember working twelve hour days, and now I'm getting older. I'm like, okay, I can't do twelve hours anymore. <laughs> I got to cut this back. What's my exit strategy? I want to be from behind the chair by the time I'm fifty. Well, that means I got to come up with another way to generate income. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make up for me being behind the chair, which is usually, for me is going to be a product line. Yep. So you have to be creative and come up with ways because I still want to contribute to our industry and stay in this industry, mm -hmm. but trying to find a creative way to, and a niche way to do that. Gotcha, gotcha. In terms of making that transition from having a suite to opening a storefront, having your own salon, mm -hmm. what did that look like? I'm sure that was... Uh, financially taxing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Buddy. You talk about talking to your accountant. <laughs> what what did that look like? That was tough because I got my feelings hurt when I went to the bank and asked for a loan, you know, and they were like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and go, go, go into detail with that. So we have a lot of, um, we have audience members that are just beginning, and then we also have business owners who want more granular information. So when you say going into the, the bank for a business loan, was it under like your LLC or business? Was it under your personal name? Just go into a little bit more detail. I had I had established a DBA. I had an LLC. I had my business plan. It was laminated. It was all pretty, and I walked into the bank, and um, the gentleman, I'll never forget, flipped straight to the back. You know, if you have a business plan, you know that in the back is the financials. And he turned to the back and he's like, yeah, you're high risk, basically. Wow. Um, and he was like offline because obviously he couldn't tell me that he was going to tell me no because I was opening up a salon. But he told me offline that salons and restaurants are typically considered high risk by banks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're not going to get funding. And so I had to come up with my own method of coming up with capital to open up the business. I just happened to have some money saved in my IRA, so I pulled money out of that um, to open the business. And back then, I didn't know about macro loans and micro loans and all of the resources that can be available to small businesses that I know about now. Mm -hmm. And all I knew was that I had to figure out a way to open this up. And yeah. the only thing, the only person I could rely on was, you know, me and my, my husband at the time um, who poured into the business as well. So we literally had to pull money from our savings to open up, open up the business. I mean, but if you're trying to start out and you don't have access to capital, um, you don't have your own resources, you don't have your own savings, you can go to the bank and try to apply for a macro or a micro loan. But you got to have your documentations and your, your finances in order. They're, they want to see the numbers because numbers don't lie. Mm -hmm. And they want to see your projections and how you plan on executing this plan because it's a risk. Yep. And they have to decide, are you worth the risk? Yeah. And am I going to get paid this money back with the interest? And mm -hmm. if they feel like that's not going to happen, you're going to get it denied. And you might get your feelings hurt because my feelings were hurt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even when we tried to finance, we tried to finance a, a vehicle through the company, denied. Yep. We tried to get an SBA loan, denied. denied. <laughs> And so we finally got our, we got got a business credit card and like some business line of credit Open to, be able to credit, build yep. the credit. And then now we got a small SBA yep. loan. Now you can finance this, finance that. And that's but, tricky because it's like, okay, you you I need the credit to open the business, but it's like, oh, but you got to have some business credit. It's like I'm just starting out. Yep. I don't have any business credit right now. So you're right, getting those um, those open lines of credit and secure credit cards to put some things on there and pay it off. Mm -hmm. You know. Filing your what is it Duns and Bradford number yep, and yep, get that all stuff that. all associated so that and now everybody's sending me stuff, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, here, mm -hmm. here we got this, we got, got this. I'm yeah. like, where were y'all ten years ago when I was trying to open up? So, yeah. yeah. But what's important and the same thing for us. So when we bought our first company vehicle, we did it out of the cash in our pockets or in our right. savings. So it is important. So we talk about business, but on the personal side, to be fiscally responsible right. personally. That way you can pour into yourself. Exactly. If you didn't go out there and get venture capital, you right. didn't you know, ask an uncle for a loan. Right. It was you and your husband at the time right. that poured into your, your company to bring your purpose to fruition. Right. Not or sure. if you don't even have an angel investor, or like you said, a family member, or people who can pour into you, you have to figure out where you're going to get this money. And that's not that's just the startup cost. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You need. We had to get construction done. So it's like, oh, okay. And then after that, 
that, you got to run the business. Mm-hmm. You need money to be able to sustain. And, you know, at Forget the time. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. That's so funny. Uh, and then you have people that you're trying to get hired. You have to have employees. You got payroll taxes. You have all this stuff that you didn't even realize you you had to do. And you have to have money in the bank to be able to, to take care of those things. And it's like, oh, snap. Nobody told me. Okay. <laughs> Just figured it out the hard way. Yeah. And, that, and that's why I'm trying to create a platform like this to be able to tell people, right? Obviously, we're not sitting down mentoring people, but, hey, we've crossed some stumbling blocks. Right. I've done taxes wrong and still paying back four or three right. years later. Let me tell you not to do that. <laughs> All right. True. Get the CPA now. Don't right. wait to Start get from the, the beginning. I'm telling you, that made a huge difference in my life was having my accountant from the very beginning. She helped set my structure up and everything. So, um, probably one of the best decisions I could honestly say that I made was having an accountant from the very, be- from the very beginning. Cause that was my, um, my weak area, yeah. you know, I wasn't very strong at that. And so having someone who was educated in that and can break it down for me was very, very helpful and how to structure my business. Um, and even as your business grows, being able to guide you and say, okay, well your LLC now, Maybe you should consider being an S-Corp. Yep. And then, you know, what does that mean? And how is that going to benefit me and my business? Me not understanding what that meant, it was very helpful to have someone on my team who could teach me those things. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the uh, the product line. I know it hasn't launched yet. You may have some things under wrap still. But talk to me a little bit about the product line. Cause that's a completely different. Yeah. It's in the same industry, but product-based business and service-based totally business different. are not the same thing. Totally different. Um, I mean, you know, obviously as being a hairstylist, product is extremely important because it ultimately determines the outcome of the style. Um, And being a hairstylist and and being in so many different heads, you see what you have different needs um, from different style. I mean, from different clients and and Mm -hmm. as far as what they're dealing with. And so my product line, like I said, is going to be catering um, to women, no matter how or men. Um, how they choose to wear their hair um, with a, uh, a shampoo, conditioner. I'm going to have a foam, a, a twisting cream. It's going to be a whole line, but again, dedicated to all bold and amazing hair strands. I mean, however you choose to wear your hair, my product line will be able to um, be used by those individuals. So I know a lot of times, um, you know, you have certain product lines, they do cater to a specific sure. specific group of people. Um, I'm trying to reverse how people think about uh, products as far as, oh, it's just for natural hair care, mm-hmm. or it's mm-hmm. just for relaxed, or it's just for this. Um, anybody will be able to use it. Tasha, got you. And then uh, the last thing I just want to talk about is that that transition. So you talked about a lot of transition mm-hmm. from, from the Dallas Morning News to being in a suite, from uh, a suite kind of doing it as a, as a side thing to doing it full time, to now you're saying, I'm transitioning out of being behind that chair, standing yeah. up on my feet for 12 <laughs> hours a day, trying to get into something that's more passive, that's more residual, right? right? Where did that mindset come from, and what is your what is your thinking with transitioning to that with your product? The mindset came from, um, I'm a graduate of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 uh, 10, business program, okay. and one of the assignments that we had to do in the course was we had to come up with an exit strategy. Mm-hmm. And it was honestly something I hadn't even thought about I'm just thinking oh I'm just gonna do hair I'm just gonna do hair and then we had to do this assignment I was like no I'm not gonna do hair for the rest of my life you know what I'm saying (laughs) at some point this is gonna get old and so what is my exit strategy what am I going to do and one of my um coaches in the program asked me had I ever considered uh launching my own product line and at the time I was like no that's not really something I want to do you know I don't want to do that you know it seems like it's so time consuming I don't want to be bothered and then as I actually started doing my research and I'm thinking about this as a billion dollar industry and you see people like even today at the time it didn't matter but today you see people like Rihanna who has become a billionaire (laughs) not because of her music talent but because she launched a beauty line Mm -hmm. and it's like ding 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 there's something here you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How can I still uh, make a contribution to this industry and still be a part of something that I love, um, but have that passive income and still be able to, you know, again, afford my life and my lifestyle and my livelihood and, and give back to the to this uh, industry that I love so much. And the product line is it. I mean, I cannot physically do hair for the rest of my life. My clients think that I can. <laughs> You know, are you gonna have a VIP group? No. no. <laughs> when I stop, I stop. Well, I'm not gonna be right. I'm exiting out of this. I'm gonna train some girls that, that can, you know, take over for me. But 
this is something that, you know, I could be 50, 60, 70 years old and still be selling product or I can pass on as a legacy to my kids yeah, um, and they can continue to do it and they don't ever have to pick up a comb or a brush or a hot comb in their <laughs> lives, you know. So um, that was really pretty much where it came from. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, advice to young entrepreneurs, advice to those who want to make that transition from their corporate or nine to five jobs into entrepreneurship. What is your main or biggest or best advice that you can give someone? Uh, I would say to do your research on the industry um, that you're thinking about transitioning into and come up with a plan. I mean, you, you, I mean, sometimes you have people that just fly by night and I, I, I guess because of the way I'm, I'm made, I just don't get that, but I'm very organized and I have to have a plan and I have to see it on paper. I have to write it down. I have to come up with my action mm-hmm. steps. And I think you have to do, do your due diligence, do your research, find somebody that's in the industry that's already walked that walk, there you go. interview them, you know, adopt them as a mentor, uh, talk to them, let them tell you the story because you, they may be able to stop you from making some of the mistakes that they've made sure. um, and make your journey a whole lot easier. Um, it's so many people that are doing a lot of the things that most of us already want to do. They've already, walk that road Mm -hmm. so why not pick their brains and figure it out but you got to come up you have to have a plan I mean you just have to you have to have a plan um I don't know how people start businesses without one (laughs) I don't (laughs) like you just you just woke up and said you was gonna do it and you didn't have a strategy on how you got to have a strategic plan on how you're going to implement it and, and come up with the steps to get it done so and get help if you uh, feel like you don't know where to start, like sure. I said, contact the SBA or find a counselor or somebody that can help you. Sure, sure. Well, that's all I have. I appreciate this. Oh, got, a lot of, got a lot of insight and wisdom. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? No, no, this is cool. I enjoyed it. Awesome, awesome. I appreciate you and uh, look forward to doing it again sometime. Sounds good. All right, appreciate you.